It's time again for the one show that takes a look at business from a different perspective. The Coaching Perspective with Master Certified Business Coach, Doug Gefeller. Hey, Doug. Hey, Paul. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Well, Paul and I are here flying solo today. It's been a long time since we haven't had a guest on the show, and uh, we'll see if we can hold it all together. So welcome to today's episode of the Coaching Perspective radio show. I'm a Master Certified Coach by the International Coach Federation, and I've been coaching leaders and their teams for 21 years, helping them to clarify their objectives and reach their goals. If you'd like to know more about my coaching services, just go to the website, thecoachingperspective.com. Well, we've got two topics for today, if we can get to them both. Uh, The first is leadership training, does it work? And the second is what works best, questions or advice? So two topics. Let's take a quick look and start off with the question of leadership training, does it work? You know, I was motivated to talk about this article, about this topic by an article in LinkedIn by Andrew Fox. Andrew is the group head of retail banking and wealth management at HSBC Bank. And if you're not following him on LinkedIn, start now. He has some great posts and some great video. Well, Andrew's article was centered around the questionable value of off-site leadership training. His premise was that by removing someone from the organization, sending them off to a leadership training program, and then reinserting them back into the organization, that that does not work. And he says this in spite of the fact that in the U.S., leadership training is a $9 billion a year business. Wow, I didn't know it was that big. He questions the ROI on this method of training and even goes so far as to claim that it's probably impossible to calculate an ROI. He also questions the ability of a person to be put back into their position after training without the organization sort of pressuring them to revert back to their prior behavior. And he further observes that true leadership training needs to take place through a contextual awareness of the environment in which they work. Contextual awareness. We'll get to that. Well, I agree with Andrew's conclusions, but I was kind of disappointed that he didn't go a step further in terms of how to make leadership training work. So if he believes it doesn't work that way, what is the solution? But like so many of us, we only have time to identify the problems and not the solutions. So I'm going to talk about the solution today. Based upon my own experience of working with executives and their teams, there's no benefit, that, and there's no doubt that we could all benefit from more leadership training. But that's not the issue. The issue is what form should that training take to affect true change in the individual and in the organization. Well, first, I believe that leadership training is best done in a group. This way, you not only train the leader, but you train the followers on what to expect from the leader. You may also be training some future leaders that you had not yet selected for individual training by using this group method. I've also observed that by training the followers, you are in fact creating an environment of accountability. Don't coaches love that? You know, it's not unusual or has been unusual for me to see a member of the group call out the leader at a later date on some aspects of the leadership style that was covered in the training but is not being put to use in the real world. Great accountability. The group training also explains to the followers why the leader's behavior is changing and what behavior they should expect as a follow-up to the group training key elements. The second major point is the concept of providing the training within the contextual environment, which what Andrew was talking about there is the idea that the training should be done within the organization, which allows the trainer to use real life examples from that firm, along with the group's own unique language and culture. When you do this, the lessons move from textbook to real world, And the benefit of real-world examples is that they're heavily layered with emotion. And we all know that real learning is best retained when it's connected with emotional learning. You know, I've often seen myself in doing presentations on leadership training. I look out on the audience, the group, and I see the glazed look when I'm showing them a PowerPoint slide with a key leadership concept. And then all of a sudden it's replaced with a loud 
Now I see how this works once we've used a real company example that may have recently occurred. Going from the textbook, going from the slide to talking about a real example. In fact, the use of both good and bad examples of leadership behavior helped to create a better understanding that will translate into the quick recognition of what's going on after the training's over. The third thing that I've experienced in my training is that the very nature of in-house training means that any significant training program is going to have to be delivered over time rather than in just one long session. Again, my experience is that this method of using a series of training periods is preferable. And the reason for that is that the next, the follow-on sessions, allows you to go back over what was covered in the previous session quickly and explore how has the training that we covered the last time shown up in the group and the individual's behavior since the last session. You know, most of us, especially when it comes to changing behaviors that we've had in place for years, we don't learn how to do that in just one session. So the ability to observe and discuss in a group what was applied and what wasn't applied provides a reality check on just how effective the training really was in the last session. If it wasn't effective, then now's the time to stop before you go on to another module and go back over the lesson that you've already covered in a different way that will increase and cement the learning. You know, my own style in working with companies is I like to combine the benefits of group training with follow-up individual coaching. All of my group training is done face-to-face. -face. I'm sitting in the client's office. We've got a group of 10, 12 senior managers. But the follow-up coaching, which is usually done over the phone, is done with individual sessions with each member that attended the group session. This usually brings up the opportunity to coach some real behavior change, and it clarifies where the roadblocks were to getting that change to really take place. I hear about the roadblocks that the individual is having and trying to apply what we talked about in the group session. And I frequently hear about what they're observing as roadblocks that other individuals are having, places where they've observed it isn't taking place. Or maybe occasionally they even point out to me a great example of somebody in the group having applied the leadership concepts we talked about in the company in the real world. You know, training only provides knowledge and maybe an opportunity to practice that new knowledge. However, coaching provides the opportunity to explore with the client why that knowledge is not being applied or why it's uncomfortable for the client. This, lends, this then leads to coaching that helps the client to have a new perspective on the issue and or their behavior. While retaining the confidentiality of the individual coaching sessions, the awareness gained from the individual coaching will help me to conduct a better, more focused training session in the next group meeting. You know, one of the important side benefits of group coaching is that after a few sessions, the participants start to coach each other. They observe how I am coaching them in the group session and then they start to apply that language and that practice, practicing out and tr trying out their own new coaching skills. You know, another unexpected benefit, as I was thinking about this today, is the on-site group training has is the curiosity factor. So let me explain what I mean by the curiosity factor by giving you a personal example. This example took place a number of years ago while I was running my building company. At that time, I belonged to an executive peer group, Tech, and monthly I would leave the office for a day to meet with CEOs of other companies. We would share problems and solutions and usually have a management consultant come in and conduct a training session for us. Of course, the next day I would show up at the office, all excited about what I had just learned the day before and anxious to put my new knowledge into practice. I soon found out that my staff dreaded it when I went to those monthly meetings because they knew that the next day they were going to be subjected to the flavor of the month management idea with no background, no explanation, no idea where it came from or what was expected. So what I've done with my clients when I coach on-site leadership training is every few months 
I asked to conduct a lunch and learn session, lunch and learn for the whole staff of the company. Now, lunch and learn is when the employees agreed to give up their lunch time in exchange for the company buying them pizza. And, of course, that's usually an easy trade-off. Everybody shows up for free pizza. And what I do is I conduct sort of an abbreviated leadership training on one of the topics that we've been talking about in the management leadership training. My observation is that a portion of the staff, once they hear what the training has been about, decide that they're perfectly happy that they're not involved in that training. And a portion of them are curious as a result of this and look forward into moving moving into the next managerial or leadership role that the company has available. So in summary, I found that on-site leadership training of the whole management team followed up with individual phone coaching and an occasional lunch and learn with the staff produces the best results in terms of not only understanding, but implementing new leadership behavior. So much for leadership training. Let's move on to the next topic for today. Today's a series of two short, short stories. So the question here is, what works best, asking questions or giving it advice? You know, it's unbelievable how many times I've heard that coaches do not give advice but only ask questions. Not only is this not true, my own observation is that most of us, including myself, coaches, fully trained, give advice at some point. But it's not only not true, it's not a right, correct statement. You know, just this last week, I went online to take the International Coach Federation's ethics class. And I ran across this important but rather lengthy statement I want to share with you. Lengthy, so I have edited it slightly. And it goes like this. It says, as coaches, we believe that clients have their own answers, and the role of the coach is to create a space for the client's wisdom to emerge. Giving advice detracts from the client's autonomy. When a coach gives advice, the client owns less of the solution. Without this ownership, there is less accountability. You know, let me just stop for a minute there. You know, it was quite a few years back before I started my coaching practice and I was uh, leaving a position. uh, Actually, I was leaving a position with the Irvine Company. It had just sold. And a good friend of mine, Ken Agate, who has since passed away, a marketing genius and and a good friend, he said, you know, Doug, we should go into the consulting business. We've done all this work with the Irvine Company about new community development. And he said, in fact, this firm down in Florida approached me, and they're willing to pay you and I to go down there and spend a few days and tell them how to develop a new community. And he told me how much, and frankly, it was quite a bit of money at that time. And I said, this sounds great. So he and I got on a plane. We flew down to Florida. We were met by the client. We went to their uh, facility. We spent two or three days. I don't remember how many now. Uh, talking to their key staff and uh, answering their questions and sharing with them the wisdom that we had gained by how to do community development. And then we got back on the plane and we started to fly home. We weren't on the plane too long before Ken leans over from his seat and says to me, wasn't that a great deal? Don't you want to create a partnership and start to do some consulting now? He said, that was a blast. And I looked at him and I said, Ken, I don't ever want to do that again in my life. He said, what are you talking about? I said, you know, there was a certain kind of excitement about listening to people sit on the edge of their seats and being able to lecture to them and share with them things that we knew that they didn't know how to do. I said, I enjoyed that part of it. I said, but you know, I am firmly convinced that when we walked out of that meeting, that they were almost never going to apply any of the things that we had talked about. And he looked at me kind of strange, and he said, so what? They gave us a check. I said, but that's not what I want to do. I want the check. Thank you very much for arranging this for us. But I want to know that what I'm doing is going to have some impact 
that people are really going to use the advice. And, you know, that really illustrated, I didn't know about coaching then, that that really illustrated what the the ICF is talking about here. They're talking about it for coaches, but it could apply to any conversation we're having with people. When we give advice, the client owns less of the solution. Without the ownership, there's less accountability. The ICF statement goes on to say, research on the relationship between advice and decision-making illustrates that the brain offloads when it's not taking, while it's taking advice. What they mean is the brain goes into neutral and the actual advice does not get embedded in the neocortex while the advice is being given. As a consequence, scientifically, ownership might happen later or might not happen at all. As coaches or as anybody, we want our clients' brains to be fully engaged. And by giving advice, we're appealing mostly only to the rational parts of the brain. However, we now know that to fully engage somebody, the emotive and sensory parts of the brain should also be involved in the decision-making process. Without a fully engaged brain, the likelihood that the client will make any decision, or in a coaching case, will make an unethical decision, increases dramatically. And then just to sort of wrap up what the ICF was saying, they're saying, as professional coaches, we should ask ourselves whether giving a client advice comes from a motivation to serve the best interests of the client or to satisfy our own ego. Ooh, that one hurt me. Everyone likes to feel respected for having given a worthwhile opinion. Listen to this. And nothing... In the ICF Code of Ethics specifically says that you may not give advice to clients. 20 years of coaching, and that was new to me. Shame on me. I knew that they discouraged giving advice, but I thought it was you can't give advice if you're going to be a good coach. That's not what it says at all. They do caution you. It goes on to say the ICF Code of Ethics does ask you to check for relationship conflicts that result from being involved in a dual role, one of coaching and one of being a consultant. It is inappropriate, confusing, and may even be unethical to switch roles during your coaching conversation without everybody really being aware of it. People in dual roles need to pay more attention to the partnership to ensure that clear boundaries exist. And that's the end of the the statement in the ethics part of what the IFC is saying. You know, it's funny how when you get on a topic, all of a sudden you see it everywhere around you. I was talking to another coach this morning, and he asked me how I respond to the question when somebody says, why do I need a coach? What are you going to do for me? And I answered him this way. I said, I like to respond this way. You hire a coach to create a partnership to help you look at both problems and opportunities. The coach is probably the only unbiased input that you will ever find. Now, that's a pretty strong statement. I say this because everyone else has some motivation besides telling you the truth that you may not want to hear. Your wife doesn't want to hurt your feelings and wants to support you. Your employees want to protect their job. Your business partner wants to protect the company and your partnership. And we can go on and on in terms of examples where there's always some self-motivation involved that may, no matter how hard we try, how good our intentions are, may in fact color the advice or, or lean the advice in one direction or another. You know, I can think of very few situations where I have not, do not have some level of bias. In fact, the only situation I can think of outside of coaching that is totally bias-free, is when we're talking to strangers. Isn't it amazing the things we'll discuss or to tell to someone when we know that we're never going to see them again and they don't know anybody that we know? It's that passenger next to you on the airplane that you don't know is never going to see you again, and that person's advice is unbiased. 
You know, business owners hire me not because they expect me to give them the answers to all of their issues, but because I have a similar background of experiences having been a CEO and started my own companies, and I know the language and what they're going through. I understand the context or the environment that they're operating in, but not really the technical issues that they're doing. So I make it very clear that my role is to help them identify what they want, what's standing in the way of their achieving it, what mindsets or assumptions are no longer serving them well, and help them create an environment where it's okay to make mistakes. Hey, we're just talking. And an environment that will foster creative thoughts and a new perspective. You know, you talk about creative thoughts. Sometimes we take our coaching conversations so serious that they're no fun at all. And yet, research shows that people are probably the most creative when they're playing, when the conversation is playful, when it is in an environment that there aren't going to be huge consequences, huge penalties to pay if you suggest something ridiculous. And, of course, that's what we want as coaches. We want to work with our clients to create those creative perspectives. So do we know really how to ask the right kinds of questions? You know, I read a blog by Marion Metcalf based on a Voice America interview with Tamara Kleinberg. And they were talking about inciting questions. And it started with this quote that I really like. Inciting questions take you down paths to those provocative answers that you are looking for. They say that if you want more breakthrough thinking out of the box, you've got to change from usual questions to inciting questions. What are inciting questions? It's those questions that can't be answered with the usual response. Those questions that cause you to stop and think, that shock you, that surprise you, so that you've got to think creatively about what, how you're going to respond. Or they're those questions that challenge your assumptions, that challenge your mindset. You know, there's questions like, what is the problem that created the problem you're trying to solve? The producer and I were talking before the show started. He said, you know, one of the one of the favorite things you've met, said over the years that I really like is when you say, you know, but do you know what you don't know? Or the way I like to phrase it sometimes is when somebody says they don't know the answer, I go, well, what if you did know the answer? And do you know nine times out of ten when I ask them that, I get the answer? This, this is weird. They just told me they didn't know. And then you go, well, what if you did know? Oh. Why is that? It's because the usual answer to the question is, I don't know the answer to that. The inciting question that causes them to stop and think and give a creative answer is, well, but what if you did know the answer to that? Oh, well, then it would be this. Or what would, what if you never changed? Or what if you never solved this problem? What would happen? You know, Inciting questions is an area that I'm curious about. This was a short article I read, and it really got me to thinking about it. And then uh, uh, just last night, I was at the ICFLA meeting, and the speaker was talking about mindset and talking about the fact that we've got a mindset, which is a tendency to respond or to think in a certain pattern based upon our experiences and our past life. And and I'm really curious about that, and I want to do some more research on it, and I think I'm going to look for a, some guests to talk to us about mindset. If you're listening out there, get a hold of me, and to talk about inciting questions, because I think those are areas that could help us. This is not just for coaches. Yes, coaches need it and can get need to get better at their business to do this, but we're all involved in this all day long, Friends, family, people, acquaintances are asking you for advice. And, you know, and, and what is the constant complaint I hear? I'm never going to give that person advice again. They asked me, and I told them. And the next time I saw them, they asked me all over again, and I told them. And the next time I saw them, they asked me all over again, and I told them, and I said, 
did you do anything about it? And they said, well, no, I'm thinking about it. You know, it's because they didn't own what was going on. It was only, in, it wasn't in the emotional response area that creates real learning. So think about asking questions rather than giving people advice. I pretty much guarantee you that they're going to be happier that they talk to you just because it's a lot easier to deal with somebody that's working with me than somebody that thinks they've got all the answers. Well, look, it's a short show today. Uh, I did want to come in even though we didn't have a guest, and I wanted to share those two issues. I think while they were short conversations, I think they're, there's a lot of meat behind them, and I would really encourage you to to think about your assumptions, your mindset on leadership training, off-site leadership training, and to think about your mindset on how often you automatically give advice when asking inciting questions might serve you and the person that's asking a lot better. Well, look, if you're uh, listening to our podcast, then thank you for visiting our website, thecoachingperspective.com. Be sure to check out our archives for other shows with some great guests. Speaking of guests, we're scheduling guests now for next year, so just uh, drop me an email, doug at thecoachingperspective.com, or go to the website. There's a place to sign up for the newsletter or to let me know you'd like to be considered as a guest, and I'll get back to you. I hope you've enjoyed the show today. Our goal, as always, is to have discussions that provide you with new ideas and information that you can put to use immediately to identify and achieve your goals. Well, next week is Thanksgiving, so enjoy your family. Take the time to acknowledge those around the table while fighting for the drumstick. And we'll be back on the 30th with Joy Castile, a new coach with great insights on how her coaching practice is going to develop. Have a great evening. You've been listening to the one show that takes a look at business from a different perspective. The Coaching Perspective with Master Certified Business Coach Doug Gefellin.